Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It's your boy, John of the Macri, with you for another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast. Coming at you. I'm recording. What, what is this? What is it? Thursday? So that means what, like it's Thursday as I'm recording this at 8.20 p.m. I think we are a week away from the... Pro, uh, what does the draft start? 8 or 8.30 usually, Andrew? 8 Probably o'clock. Eight. 8 o'clock on the docks. So we're probably a week away from the Kings being on the clock and the draft actually starting. Um, let me tell you, we've had some famous people here on the KFS pod, but we're, we had to really go special, go bigger, go home, because uh, we have joining us tonight uh, America's newest, ni- how should we phrase this? Newest niche podcast, sub niche show viral sensation he's a hit with the 16 to 19 year olds is that a demographic i don't even know it is now it is now yes (laughs) joining me for tonight's mailbag chris percy einen hello sir hello it's nice to be on here where i where i started at kfs i was just telling someone earlier today who was asking me um, about my show because I posted on my Instagram that I was doing Dream. I was like, actually, yes. this this September is three years with KFS for me. Oh, my God. Has, has it been three years since I got a DM from a kid at... Where'd you go? You went to Fordham... Uh, uh, no, no, you, Ber- Bergen County Academy. I was just okay. starting my senior year, still 17. That's right. And you had taken over KFS. There was a power vacuum. Uh, <laughs> the tyrannous... Jonathan Macri had taken over the tyrannous. What he had, he had begun his dictatorship, and I figured, you know what, it's worth a shot. It was so a well. I, it was a well worded. You slid into my DMs, but it was it was it was more it was more finely written than the than the people that usually slide into my DMs, uh, with the exception of Frank. The, I saw the IRS. Was always, so like, what do you mean? Who's sliding into your DMs? What are you talking about? No. Let's get let's get serious. <laughs> let's let us get. Of course, let's get serious. You know what serious means? Mailbag. But before, actually, no. In all seriousness, because I, I think I did this effect last time we did a mailbag, but I, I will triple down on it now. You you really. Just as as Andrew shared with you beforehand, uh, above and beyond with draft class, the episodes just keep getting better and better. The guests were awesome. The information was great. Uh, and I think it was it really was a great service to listeners because, like, as you know, I didn't have time to start getting into the draft stuff until over the last like month, maybe six weeks at most. So yep. I was not ready to be doing draft shows. Uh, and you were and you obviously showed that and you killed it so uh and the ep- the best part is the episodes are evergreen so like if you're sitting here listening to this and you're like want to get yourself um a crash course in the draft uh with a week to go 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 check out that many of the episodes of, of draft class on your on your next film school podcast feed speaking yeah. of mr macri there are some people with uh some curiosities about this upcoming nba draft aren't there always yeah you know i i had someone the other day tell me that After watching the Berman episode, they went and binge watched episodes one through eight of draft class, which is like very exciting to to me, like binge watch. Like, that's so cool. Um, But even then, there are still questions. I can't answer them all. But you, sir, you can. I will try. As always, I have not seen these questions. Um, I didn't even get a chance to scroll and like glance at anything today. So I am coming in, (laughs) coming in hot. I was gonna say John usually knows when when Fuddy had a question about chicken no, I don't know. or something, I've, but there's there's nothing today. No, you got you got you got no idea. I think I I caught one thing that was like I had a sarcastic answer in mind for, but if I, I'll let you know if it's if it comps up. And I, All I, right. I saw it. Well, let's get started. Coming first up is Jaden, a supporter of KFS Log Time, and now a supporter of Draft Class. So much love. We know this front office hasn't leaked too much during their time here. However, with reports on what Portland is looking for out of seven and nothing really from the Kings direction, are you getting increasingly worried about where, even if Randall is traded at this point? Oh, I'm very, very, very worried. That's a great first question. I um, so I, as I'm sure you know, uh, this has been, I think, probably the biggest point of disagreement between Jeremy and I over the last, you know, since the season ended, in that he remains convinced that Randall will be on a different team 
uh, come next season. And I just, I just don't see who the team is that, that wants him. I, I, you know, it's funny. I, and I feel responsible for this because I spent last season and the beginning of this all season pitching Randall, fake Randall to Sacramento trades and fake Randall to uh, Portland trades. And based on everything that I can gleam, um, those, those are not things that are going to happen uh, because those te- like, especially Portland, you know, and that's why I fa- found the interview with Danny from last week. So informative and enlightening. He's, he's fantastic. He's, oh, he's way. great. And, but like, if you're, if they're, if they think that they have a real chance at OG and Anobi, which it sounds like they do, um, like again, I don't want to get into the whole like, oh, is OG Ananobi at his best better he's than so G- overrated? Okay, fine. You want to say he's overrated? Great, but there is a definable like you. You kind of know what you're going to get from that dude on the no, floor every yeah. night. I and if they're and and that's what that's why I think there's a very good chance we're going to be looking at Randall in Nick's uniform next year because I, I don't know how if you're an a NBA team how between the on court. And then, I, as I remember that we talked about last time, the off court, like how how can you have any confidence in like we we know what we're going to get from this player and this person going into the game tonight? For for those reasons, I don't think he is going. If they move up to seven or four uh, or seven and then four, like, I got I don't know how it would go. I don't think Randall's going to be a part of it unless I'm grossly mistaken. And, and I, my God, am I hope do I hope I'm grossly mistaken on that? Um, but I, I, that said, I think they're, I think they want to trade him, um, and I think they are. You know, phone lines are open, as as they say. I, I love the descriptor there. Grossly mistaken. You were very confident that it is grossly. You know, this is really painting the picture, John. <laughs> Why? Thank you. Next question comes from me. NY fan 07. Their name is me. No, I, Chris Percy Einan, did not ask this question, but their name on Twitter is me. So yeah, there you go. And it's uh, conveniently right in line with your answer to the previous question. I wonder who predicted how you would answer the Q and then... You know me the, too well at this point. The Knicks don't get Brunson. Don't move Randall. Keep pick 11. Lose Mitch Robinson, but are able to consolidate one to three guys, Burks, Noel, Kemba, some of them into either a couple of picks or a non needle mover kind of upgrade with this hypothetical laid out. What would their plan be at the trade deadline of this oh my next God. season? Okay. Can I just ask for, okay. So <laughs> just to recap, Randall's they, still here. Randall's they here. They Brunson. don't get Brunson. They draft that 11. Okay. All right. And then they can consol- they consolidate the rotation and they get a, like a serviceable return. Like de- yeah. You know, maybe Jeremy's maybe Jeremy's Hayward idea, but without the picks and they just take Kemba Noel, they eat the bad money, you know, something like that. Um, um, yeah, I know. would sooner say that it would be something like. So this I don't know if we're going to get another question on Brogdon, but like, I, I, you know, send send expiring money to Indiana and and the you know, the Dallas pick and like some seconds, but I, uh, this, this is where I disagree with people. I don't think, I think Brunson's value is, or uh, sorry, Bryden's value is higher than that. Maybe they don't pay it. I don't know, but I, they need to start a point guard next year and it's not going to be Emmanuel quickly, unfortunately. Um, anyway, so what do they do with the trade deadline? Is that the ultimate question? Yeah. You know, you can assume how that first half of the season would go RJ Randall. Uh, obviously if Randall's back, we're assuming it's in a reduced role, right? So Probably not jockeying for that number one spot the way they really awkwardly were last season, but a little bit more order to how things are going. What happens at the trade deadline? <clears throat> Barring like there is, <laughs> it's amazing. No matter how many times you get beaten with the same stick, you still come back and you're like, I'm, I I think I, next time will hurt less. Uh, barring something unexpected, because I do think, and and again, Andrew will remind me of these famous last words as they surely don't come to fruition throughout the season. I think Obi and Randall are going to play together this season if they start out on the roster together. There's Andrew laughing in the background, as he should, as he should, as he should. Um, I think it's going to be five, six minutes a game, but I think okay. it's going to be. I can see, I can meet you eye to eye on that. Berman okay. on draft class said, I that, know. Um, he, 
totally Thibodeau being he totally wasn't going to do it last season and that he finally, whatever took him so long, has noticed improvements in the rebounding, in the shooting, in what he does. So if Randall is someone who he knows could benefit from a smiling, beaming, offensive uh, you know, bolster of Obi Toppin, then yeah, I could see them getting five minutes a game. Five. Let's say five. I am going to order a KFS chalkboard for each of you. And in Bart Simpson fashion, you're going to write a thousand times Obi and Randall will not play together under Tom Thibodeau. You know what, Andrew? Eat my shorts. That's what I have to say to you. I'll write that on the chalkboard if he actually does it. Okay. I eat John shorts. <laughs> unless, unless that pays unexpected dividends and the Knicks are like, once again, one of the fun stories in the league behind this, you know, death lineup with the, with the two powerful, like, which I, I'm sorry. I, whether it works or not, and I think it'll work, I struggle to see the Knicks having a successful season next year in the scenario you laid out or at least successful enough to the point where they're like, I don't know, it's, I guess similar to the 2020, 2021 season where they're like competing for home court. Um, I would say one of Randall or Obi top and will get traded before the deadline. That would be my big prediction. I don't think, I mean, I don't know, maybe the jazz start off just really badly and, and Donovan starts putting the pressure on before the deadline. I don't see that. I think that's a 2023 off season thing. Yeah. Um, I don't, I mean, look, things change. You never know. Like James Harden got traded in the middle of the season, like crazy shit happens. It's the NBA, but an account the other day, that's definitely very credible and real said that the Knicks are talking to about Shea Gilgis Alexander with. Oh yeah. I'm sure they are. Sure. Those, those conversations are ongoing. Um, We know the Knicks like him for real, but I, you know, Sam Presti with the number two pick is just dying to dump. The only thing he knows is really, I think I actually, I think that's like one of the safer bets on like that SGA will be traded in like the next two to three years, but not right now. And not, not to the next. Um, yeah, so I think one of Randall and Obi will be traded before the deadline. One, yeah, one of Obi or Randall will be traded before the deadline, because if Obi is still sharing time here with Julius, um, unless again, unless he's just, unless it's going way better than we could have ever imagined, because he, you know, his his agent, CAA, hello, need to worry about their client getting paid, and he's extension eligible next summer. So, like we saw Cam and his group. Uh, I forget who he's represented by quietly and tactfully and respectfully and professionally put the screws to Atlanta over the summer. Like I have no reason to believe that Obi Toppin's uh, people will not do the same thing to the Knicks if they haven't already done so. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I don't know how deep into Knicks front office lore you are, but I, I like to imagine the father son argument, dad, I'm trying to get my client paid. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Relax. I, give, give me patience. I'm going to handle but this. That's yeah. the, that's the thing is like Leon Rose. I, I this is going to sound like damning praise. The, the, the thing he's been best at so far here is kind of kicking a can down the road. And I think he has successfully kicked the OB Julius can down the road but he can only kick this thing down the road so much longer at some point, like these guys, these two are not going to be long for the team together. Like one of them is going to be gone sooner, probably rather than later. Makes sense. Makes complete sense. Uh, again, speaking of one of the two being gone, it's a straight, it's a yes or no. It's we're keeping it simple. It's coming from a longtime supporter of the KFS halftime live. Someone who's always in the halftime live show and love hot dog. Hot dog has a question for you, John and hot dog wants to know if you no idea hot dog is, but sure. I listen, I respect hot dog. Would you trade 11, the Mavericks first, the Knicks 2023 first round pick and some second rounders. If it meant you could add cam reddish and Julius Randall and get back the fourth pick and salary filler. So let me recap for you because I just did a yeah Jer- Jeremy I mean, explosion in your no mind. no I, keep keep going eleven Mavs first Knicks twenty three first some second round picks Cam Reddish and Julius Randle for 
a shit sandwich, a salary, and the fourth overall pick. So I don't know if we're getting other teams involved here, uh, but the the shit sandwich of salary is I don't know that that could really apply here because the Kings for all, for any issues they may have, um, they don't have a ton of bad money on the books right now. It's basically like you want to say Rashawn Holmes with uh, three more three more years, the the last of which is a player option. But like that's a that's a good number. And you heard, um, uh, oh my God, who do we have on from the Kings? Uh, Brendan Nunez. Brendan, thank you, Brendan Nunez. Come on here and like talk about how they view that as an asset. And honestly, I'm not. I don't think that's ridiculous. Rashawn Holmes is a freaking good NBA center, and that's a fair contract. I know we had some issues this year. Uh, I think Harrison Barnes is like good, good money. 18 million, 18.3 million next season for a guy that's like very solid starter in the league. You know, like they don't. So like the Kings are giving up something that they, that, that is not terrible in that, in that trade. That said, it comes down to is the is the pick on what where what are the protections on the pick? I my my inclination is to unprotected. say unprotected. If Randall's yeah, okay. going out and you're getting four okay. back, unprotected. Because I don't think the Knicks care about anything else in that deal other than the pick. I don't think they care one iota about eleven. I don't think they care what about the the Dallas picks. I would bet on if you gave me an over under of. 27 and a half. I'd probably take the over in terms of like where that pick lands, especially after the wood trade that we, I think we both like. Um, I described it on dream as going into NBA 2k yeah, and taking all your like, okay. You know what Nick fans think they can do to put together a package for like literally anyone in the league. Like uh, yes. rem- remember the Kevin Knox and Mavs 21 pick was going to get us Zach Levine. And, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> like, um, that, but it actually worked because Christian Wood has like ridiculous losery attitude problems, which I think playing with one of the best players in the league will solve very quickly. I, yeah. And like, again, uh, I forget well, one of the people that I have on notifications who like major NBA media people like tweeted last night, like he's going to try next year <laughs> to contract years and try. That's really all it's about <laughs> sometimes just try and put an effort. Um, oh God. An unprotected 2023 pick. You know what, though? That's why you keep Tom Thibodeau, right? Uh, yeah, I think they do it. I think yep. they do it. Maybe, you know would what? You do, I, you do it personally, though? Was the would question? I? Would I? Yeah. I, oh, okay. goodness. I think. Here's the thing. Again, and I, 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 I am, I could be so off base with this. I really could be. I, I, but. I think there's enough there with Ivy that you take the chance and it's not, I don't say that you take the chance because I'm like sold on Ivy as being the next, I I, I think Donovan Mitchell actually might be the best comparison for as, for as different as they are athletically in terms of just like style of play and projecting growth in a couple of key areas that would take them from whatever fourth pick in the draft and in Mitchell's case, obviously it was much lower to a guy that's a borderline all NBA guy. And in Ivy, you hope that it could be a little bit higher than that. Um, like yeah. I, I just, I think when you're looking at the Knicks right now and you're looking at other possible opportunities that are going to be on the board in the coming future, Again, there are only three ways to get players in the NBA. You either, you either draft them, you trade for them, or you sign them in free agency. Free agency is not an option for them for the it, in the next. It's not three real. Years. It's not and real. Le- I, again, I I know there's been there's like what there's smoke now that LeBron might re, you know not resign. Okay, great. You re- really we're gonna go down that road again? How many times is this now? I wasn't old <laughs> enough for for the <laughs> decision. Just a face. The decision was was a full year before I really got like enamored with the NBA and yeah. the product. So this would be my, actually my first go around with a, a, a real New York spin on it. And I don't think I would be looking forward to that. So no, and it would been over this. He's coming. He's coming. Of course. Um, so then it's, then it's draft or trade and like, you know, okay. Things again, things change situations develop, but like right now the trade, the guy who, who is going to be available via trade, that's the best and might be available the soonest is Mitchell. And you're, they're going to have competition for his services. Miami is going to absolutely be in that. 
and maybe they get it's like this is here ivy is here you can if there is a world where you could get him and you get him for a price because i tell you one thing the price that you just named to go up and get ivy it's a hell of a lot less it's going to cost to go get donovan mitchell and maybe ivy's a better player you know well again we don't know maybe he's a worse player there is risk involved but if i'm the knicks i think there comes a point where the risk it's it is worth the risk and I in the trade you just named, I mean, God, an unprotected pick next year. But that's why, again, I go back to this. That's why you hire Tibbs. The Knicks just had a season from hell in which it felt like on some nights, to me at least, wow, this can't get any worse. And they won 37 games, you know? And I would argue that they would have won just as many, if not more, if Julius Randle was off the team. So I, I think for all of those reasons, yes, I make the deal. All right. I do have to do the prerequisite. Well, who's the coach who blew all those leads retort. Um, But after that, I will say that, yeah, I think the conversation with Ivy is like, oh, would the 23 unprotected pick be worth giving up to move up? Not assuming that Randall's, you know what I mean? Like people are like not even thinking about the Randall out part of that. And yes, there's a world where we do it again and we wait thinking that at this upcoming trade deadline we have we will have rehabbed Randall's value to an extent where we can get a package for him that we're comfortable accepting um but you know if that's going to happen then other things need to happen and <laughs> if those don't happen then it's going to get worse right so it's just it you know what it does and it, again i and i just want to be very clear to anyone who's like yelling at their whatever they listen to this podcast on like how in god's name macri knowing the history of this organization over the last 20 years and what has transpired with picks that with unprotected picks that they trade away. How in God's name could you give that pick away in a draft that again, Chris, you would know more than me, but from what I understand, it's supposed to be a pretty good draft with uh, a, a name or two at the top that is like, Oh my God, change your franchise for the next 15 years type of guy. That's why I'm like, can they get top one protection on the pick? Can they get top two protection on the pick? Like even something like that. Um, would I think make such a big difference and make me feel so much more comfortable? It's a risk. It's, it's a risk any way you cut it, but it's like, man, it would make it so clean. It's like, here's our team. This is what we have. We're going forward with this, with this group. We're going to grow with this group. Um, and that to me would be pretty exciting. Plus for anybody that was pro play the kids, like, like Chris, you got a question today during your live stream. Like we tanked and uh, we didn't tank and it, cost us spots and that's why we're going from 11 to four and it's like well those of you that wanted to play the kids once we played them we came back against miami Obi had a career high against washington and that had another one against toronto those are three wins that because all of you clamored for playing the kids which in conventional wisdom around the nba playing the kids is also known as tanking in some ways like the next low-key tank not when Wait. Kemba Walker is getting minutes for your well, team. That's my point. Like this Alec, idea Alec that Alec Burks was the worst crunch time player yeah. in the history of basketball. Yeah. He's the best tanking weapon in the league. I just think it's important to recognize that if Jaden Ivey comes here in this scenario that, that this question was painted, like you're not losing any of the kids that actually improved the team once they started playing heavy minutes. So there is a world with, to John's point, a coach that will literally Absolutely. fight to the death every night in order to win like that they win more games and that pick is in like the teens and then who cares you have Jaden Ivy and this young core and yeah, just exactly. like the, no, the notion of like I, I'm not even gonna say it out loud it's, it's, I, why, why would I why do I do this to myself but like starting for your New York Knicks opening night Jaden Ivy uh RJ Barrett Quentin Grimes Obi Toppin and I don't really give a fuck at center um pick a, that Fit that on a jersey, Chris. I don't really give a fuck. You think? <laughs> is that more or less than Shea Gilgis with, Alexander? With no spaces. With no spaces. No spaces. It's probably less. Yeah. Um. But uh, no. Yeah. I mean, like, like, uh, uh, whatever. And then you get you get quickly is still here, and um, who am I? And and you you know you keep a veteran or two to come off the bench. Like that's, gosh, how excited would we be to to watch that? And I'm not saying they'd be great. They'd probably be pretty bad. I don't. I don't care. That's how you bring Mello back. There you got it. That's <laughs> oh, good, hold good, on to that thought. Good job oh, you. okay. I'm hold ready. on to I'll that get the thought. jersey ready. Don't worry. I right, got ahead, Chris. Our next question, though, comes from someone who 
I have to be honest, I have a good time including their questions in these mailbags because they're always coming to the table with a level of nuance that just puts John in hell. And I love it. I like that. I like when John suffers and struggles and uh, that is fun for me. So coming in from Frazier Coleman is actually a really good question to follow up this last one. Again, wonder who made that happen. Uh, What's the best plan B if Ivy is too costly? Option one, bundle a vet and 11 trade up for Matherin. Option two, keep 11, try to trade vets for picks. Option three, trade down, add more assets. Option four, uh, fuck plan B, stick with plan A, Um, which would be Ivy. Yeah, I'll go with I'll go with D. Um, (laughs) I don't. So, again, I get dinged by Knicks fans for devaluing our own players. And it's just, (laughs) it's just because I have a memory of this season. And I remember sitting in front of my computer hearing these same people who are critiquing me now um, about, about devaluing our own players, those same folks yelling and screaming about how our players suck and we need better players and they're not good. Like it's, it was reported. Um, Oh my God. Who was the report that it was recent about like Randall and, and Fournier? Nobody, nobody wants these, these deals. Um, Fisher. Fisher. Yes. That was a Fisher report. Thank you. I, I forgot. Um, and Fisher's like, look, man, he's, I think he's proven his metal. He's, he's pretty reliable. So who else are te- like, are we moving up by packaging a 34 year, soon to be 34 year old Derek Rose and 11 to get to where and what um, like Alex, Sorry, I would Alex. assume trading up for Matherin is just trying to get to eight. Yeah, but again, it's like the, the notion of, and I'm not disparaging the question. I think it's a great question, but like there's no veteran on the team. Unless you want to, I mean, you want to talk about quickly? I think quickly gets you to seven. I think he's quickly. Not, he's not a veteran. Put that put that thought down. Put it okay. down. I'm Look, I don't want to trade Emmanuel quickly to get up to seven. Um, although I wonder, can he get you to seven and then maybe something else? Get you to see that's the, that's my path to four, and I don't know if I want to do that. Is quickly an eleven get you to seven, and then twenty the unprotected twenty three pick and seven get you to four. I'm ready to go down in flames for this, but as someone who has Good. extensively studied this draft class, I would not trade Emmanuel quickly for the eleventh pick. Like if the New York Knicks called me and I had Emmanuel quickly, and they said we have pick eleven and we will give it to you. If you give us a manual, oh, I a hundred a thousand. I would not do that. I would not take the opportunity to draft that eleven to hope. You ever seen the Family Guy clip where Peter? Did, I just mentioned this on Dream. Peter gives up the yacht for the mystery box because it might be a yacht. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Griffin. Now I know you've been here all day, so if you'll just sign this contract without reading it, I'll take your blank check, and you won't not be not loving your timeshare before you know it. Oh, uh, look, slick. We're not going to buy your lousy timeshare, all right? Now where's my boat? Oh, hold on. You have a choice. You can have the boat or the mystery box. What are you crazy? We'll take the boat. No, 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 not so fast, Lois. A boat's a boat, but the mystery box could be anything. It could even be a boat. You know how much we've wanted one of those. Then let's just... We'll take the box. Emmanuel quickly is exactly what you're looking for in the range of 11 to 14. As someone that you think has some upside, but you know can contribute now. I'm not doing it. How about this? How about Matherin? I don't know if this is too disparaging of Matherin. Again, I have not done as much homework on Matherin as you. I am not a big fan of him, and I think he's going to be good. But someone compared him to Brandon Roy, and I almost had a stroke. Come on. No, it's but like to me, if 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 Matherin hits like and again, I I, we can't really say this about quickly because the the dirty little secret is the shooting numbers kind of are what they are. Um, But like if if quickly shoots it like I know we both believe that he will like that's 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 a nice player for that's a nice turnout for Matherin. Right. Um, I know Matherin does some other things too, and they're not, it's not a perfect comp, but like, no, I'm, so I just want to be very clear, but it, that I'm not, I'm not throwing around manual quickly just to like move up to seven. I'm, I'm, I would think about it if it got me to four, that's, that's, I want to be very, I, that's what I want to be because, very, very clear about that's that. because of who's there at four. Like, again, yes, there's, exactly. there's a lot of nuance to that and it's um, not ridiculous. So, no, you know, I'm just saying like, if it were, 
in this draft class, which I think like picks seven to 17, uh, the team's big boards are literally just all the same names in a different order. Like no one has the same board from seven to 17. It's yeah. very, very, you know, Dyson Daniels, a great example of this. I have him 15th on my board right now. I love him as a prospect. I think that as a do it all wing three and D if that three shot comes along, but as a connector in the Lonzo ball role at an inch taller, you're going to get a really good player at a Dyson Daniels. He might be making over 20 million a year on that next contract. However, a lot of people are saying, hey, this guy is a lead guard. He is a primary. There's LaMelo, there's Giddy, wow. and there's Daniels. And those people would take him. I just did a mock draft, you know, Mavs draft. I was just yeah. in his community mock and Dyson Daniels went third overall in that. Now, is that ever so, happening in real life? No, but there are people that high on him who are smarter than I. And that just well, I think that shows I that shows a lot about this draft. Don't draft. don't don't disparage yourself. I think, again, there's this. We throw around, and I'm, I promise I'm going to answer the question. Um, we throw around this term lead guard without, I don't think there's like an agreed upon definition amongst just like basketball fans. Like, what is a lead guard? Is it a point guard or is it a true, we, I'm going to initiate your offense? Because there's a big fucking difference between those two things. And Dyson Daniels can, he, I think he can play point guard in the next level. And I think he could definitely be um, a perfect. Marcus Smart esque, not not perfect comparison because Marcus Smart does a little creation. I think you know I don't know if Daniels is ever going to do that, but uh, anyway, I'm digressing. Long winded way of saying I don't think the option where the Knicks are trading a, a veteran to move up is a real option. So what? And I already said my piece on I, I would prefer uh, to move up for Ivy above all of these. What are the other two options? Stick at eleven and yeah, yeah. So trade down or. Uh, keep eleven, trade vets for picks. Just try to you know dump. Um, or yeah, trade then, down. Okay, I, I trade down, um, and I think they will trade down if they can't trade up. Meanwhile, we should say on Twitter, the, the, the good old Twitter dot com, and obviously we're recording this right now, so we did not see this. Apparently, Woj reported the Knicks are trying to trade up for Ivy. Um, if you listen to uh, draft class, you already knew. <laughs> that? I, I love you. <laughs> How about that? Uh, next question. Noodles wants to know if Julius gets traded and we have OB starting, who are your top three backup four options to go after? And why are they all Carmelo Anthony? Listen, if they trade, if they trade Randall and it's OB starting by all means, bring him home. I don't even, I'll, I'll, I'll be the, I will be the person to roll out the red carpet. Um, that said, that said, uh, let me. This is not something I've allowed myself to think a whole lot about before, because I don't want to get my hopes up. I'll say this: I don't think they're just going to hand that role to to Cam Reddish. I don't think they see Reddish as a backup four. I think they see or as a straight four. I think they see Reddish as like, you know, he's a he's a combo a wing. Like he, he might be able to play some. Four, but they will not go into next season with like Cam Reddish as their backup four. That is not he, a thing that is going to happen. He also, despite his height, which is a knock on him, that people have been like, "Oh, he was so good in high school. He hasn't worked on improving, and he's coasting on talent." Like he doesn't really like to bang down low. He's not one of those guys that's going to go in the posts and and work you. He is a perimeter guy. You know, that's something we got at Julius for this year, falling in love with the perimeter game as opposed to keeping it simple and pressuring the rim. That's that's something Cam does too. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, that's that's a good call. Um, I wanna I wanna give one more name besides what I've just given to, um yeah, they asked for three, but uh oh no, I, that's right. You, you they're all you Carmelo. Have, I thought they're all Carmelo. Right? Yeah, I mean, so you got you got two others. I thought I got one if you don't if you don't mention him. So I mean not it's not probably. like there's guys that they could take flyers on. Honestly, my can I say that I would hope in that case that they would draft Jeremy Sochan? Yeah, sure. Or I'll, I'll, I'm going to add EJ Liddell to that if we trade down. I, is, isn't Liddell going to play more? If he really hits as an NBA player, isn't he going to be a center? Or you think he's he could, he's going to be a four? Small ball center, four. Four. Okay. So, he's, yeah. Um, I mean, I know the Grant Williams comps are... are uh, I don't like it. I think he's better. You know, you really? Okay. I'd, a- I'm, I'd, I'm taking EJ. Next up, from Ulti Rad. If Johnny Bryant goes to Utah, who is your choice to be Tibbs' successor? Someone for the Knicks to get in the building or just keep their eye on long-term? 
We know Tommy T, even if he's great, um, isn't exactly in his prime. <laughs> I oh, I want him to coach till he's a hundred. Is that going to be my like a, like no. a Supreme Court, like a Supreme Court term, just until death <laughs> he gets get to hold the position. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Oh my God. We are we are far removed from the days of Thibodeau's Connecticut mullet. Uh, yeah, we are. So. He's not a young man anymore. Um, replacement for Tom, um, if it's not Johnny Bryant, that's a great question. The I would say the best coach now not coaching is Quinn Snyder, right? Doesn't that? I think I would agree. I think he gets a little overrated by nerds like myself because we love the kinds of three point looks that his offense creates. But I think he's a good coach still. It just, he might be getting a little too much hype and I might be contributing to that. So sorry. No, I mean, that's, that's fine. Um, yeah, this is like the, the issue, the problem with this is like, you, you know, you see these, you see these like lists. I forget who on ESPN puts out the list every year. Maybe it's Pelton or Arnovitz, like one of those guys of like, the up and coming, like the next hot coaching prospect. Um, and there are guys that show up on this list year after year after year. Once upon a time, Tom Thibodeau showed up on that list year after year after year. And uh, guess who else did? Uh, David Fisdale. <laughs> and I was going to say Darvin Ham was going to be my guest because he was yeah, Har- killing it in the G League. But Ham, Ham also. Um, so, like, you just, you never know how it's going to work out. Uh, I'll go with my, my pet answer, which has been forever in a day. Like I would love to be the team that hires Becky Hammond uh, knowing full well, it's yes. probably not going to happen. Uh, so yes, I'll, I'll yes, go, yes. I'll go, I'll go Becky. Hammond. Love it. Thank you for that answer. Uh, of course. I, I mean, I, I mean, I'm going to root for her wherever she gets a shot, but I would, if it was here. Amazing. We'll see, man, unless San Antonio really likes Quinn, or even um, Will Hardy uh, to be their future head coach. They still might go ham and, and make one. Of Hardy's guys. a good name. Hardy's he, a good name. He remembered we gave him an interview. Uh, oh, I, before, I do remember. And I remember, hired I, yeah, remember I remember him wrote a, wrote a whole article on that guy for Sports Illustrated. No, but I, I actually I remember that article and I remember the, the Hardy buzz as like this guy is him and not Hammond is, I think, low key the successor in san antonio um but you know we'll see so yeah that's a name i'd keep an eye on as well all right coming up next from kivy now this question um is is entering dangerous territory for you so i will i will put a warning that oh, this is a from a nick's perspective and not from a john perspective because okay. that way you don't end up on a highlight tape saying rj barrett's the fifth most valuable asset on the, oh my on god the Kivy wants to know why are the Knicks afraid to give IQ the starting PG spot? This is the question I saw on Twitter. And here's my answer because I think James Dolan knows he'd be responsible for the cleanup fee for all the ticker tape that would be used on the championship parade that we would be going down when Emmanuel quickly led the Knicks to an inevitable world championship. Um, No, I mean, I think they see his archetype of like, if a, you say the words Lou Williams, I'm leaving. No, this. no, no, no. I think he's a lot better than Lou. Uh, I shouldn't. Let me rephrase that. Cause Lou Williams is a damn good player. Like you don't just they don't give six he's, man of the he's year. Currently not better than Lou will ever. Yeah. But yeah, I, because projection, I think projection like, but a guy who is, like you look at this, look at just look at the start, starting point guards in the league today. Okay, they are, I would say, I don't know, half of them are like the nominal point guards. Half of them are like all star level engines for their team. They create offense. I don't like Emmanuel. Quickly is not that. I don't. I, I hope I'm wrong about that. I hope he becomes that, and he pr- continues to prove us all wrong. But I don't. I don't think he's that. In the very least, I don't think the Knicks see him as that. Okay, fine. So then it's like you go to the next group, and this is the conversation we were having before about like what is Dyson Daniels about guys who are the nominal starting point guard for their team, and they do a lot of stuff, and they're really amazing in some areas, like your your Kyle Lowry's, your like obviously Marcus Smart. 
Um, I, my pick for the Nick who's going to be on that list before IQ is Mr. McBride. I, I say on, on draft okay. guys, I, I love him I as, a, as a point guard in a lineup where there's a jumbo initiator. Having a, a thicker guy at the one to stop the offense's first action is how Boston and how Miami were your two Eastern Conference Finals teams this year. So yeah, you could even you could even throw Drew Holiday in this, and Drew Holiday can obviously, as we've seen it, can create if called upon um, in a pinch. Ideally, he's not one of your top two creators, and if he's not, you're probably winning an NBA championship like the Bucks did last season. Um, you know, but there are like other guys, and and then. You, you know, you have like probably a, a a third category where it's like in a perfect world, we would rather this person not be starting a point guard for us. So I think the Knicks look at quickly as like in our perfect world, we are going to have someone better than him at that position. So let's continue to use him at what we believe is his best long-term role now since we think when we're competing for a championship, that's the role that he will be in as this a is man. fair. This is fair. I don't, I don't think it's insane. All that being said, it's like for where they're at right now, you know, like, like Jesus Christ, like th- that's why it pains me every time I, I hear or read another Brogdon rumor. Um, Cause like, what are we doing here? Like remember when like summer league rolled around last summer and they were like, we're going to give IQ the keys completely and see if he crashes this car. And he like was driving their 94 Accord. Like it was an Aventador. And then people were like, no, I actually still don't think he can play point guard though. Cause it was only the summer league. What the hell is the summer league for that? He showed Why do growth. we play games? He showed growth in that span of whatever it was. 10 days. Even, even Berman. Mark Berman came on my show and told me that he is not going to be the person to discredit quickly and top in because their good performances were at the end of the year when a lot of people say teams aren't trying. Why are we as Nick fans so comfortable being in doctrine? Uh, I, I, you know, I could go on forever. I just look the, the, the again. Kid's good. The kid's good. He's 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 good. And more than that, there's a reason why he's the name that I feel like comes up. Around like if you want to say talk about who who do other teams around the league want? They want RJ Barrett and they want Emmanuel quickly. Those are the two guys. That's the list, you know. Um, and there's a reason for that. Absolutely. Uh, a quick, I think you know. I say this like I, I went viral in the wrong way at the deadline for saying I wouldn't include him for Fox, and I'm like, no matter what you think he is right now like what he's going to be is not getting valued and it's not getting baked in because he's not playing so you're losing that trade no matter what because even if you don't think he's going to go blow up you don't have evidence to say you think that or not <laughs> you know like you you don't have enough to stand on uh the thing yeah. with the thing just very briefly like i think also the other part of it with and this is definitely some nick's nick's ptsd here we're like in, indoctrinated into thinking that the other shoe is going to drop on a prospect and like they're, they're not going to be all that. And that has obviously happened a lot, but quickly has already, he's already gotten past that. Like he, is he a, has us talking about a role for him. That's a tier above what we yeah. were hoping he might be when we drafted him. You like know? he is so, a, he is a valuable NBA player today. He was a valuable NBA player as a rookie. Like these are facts. These are not projections. These are not like, Oh, we're looking at things through blue and orange colored glasses. He's just good. And it's just a matter of how good he could be. That's the only question. What's cool is that even though he's 22 years old, apparently you need to know the answer to that right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't have to go there. I-95 bully. So seems like someone I would not want to be driving next to in the morning. Uh, wants to know if it's a failure if the Knicks end up picking 11th. And I included this question, not for you to answer it with yes or with no, but because I figured this would be the perfect opportunity for you to share some of your favorite options at the 11th pick, where if the Knicks picked them, maybe the pick wouldn't be a failure if those options exist, of course. So what do you think? Um, man, that's tough because I, do I think it would be a failure? 
No, I don't think it would be a failure. I mean, if they love someone on their on their board, like it's such it's such a tough question, right? Because like we don't know what their evaluation is, and like I I don't think that there is my perception of this draft, and and Chris, I'm I'm curious to hear what you say after I say my piece. Is that there is there's like your there's the top tier, which is you know in whatever there's the, there's the guys that we know are not going to slip to the Knicks, which are uh, the top three and Ivy and Murray. And then it seems like originally this draft was like, Oh, any, you know, anywhere from six to 12 or 13 is fluid. Now it feels like that's not the case anymore either. And that there is another sub tier of guys who we also know, even though they're not in that top five, are not slipping to the Knicks. And for me right now, that's Dyson Daniels. That's Benedict Matherin. Um, and I would probably include Shaden Sharp, although it seems like Sharp could maybe fall to 10, but it, I don't yeah. think any, yeah, I don't, I don't think anybody sees him getting past 10. So like, let's put those seven players aside and assume that the, that none of those guys are going to fall to the Knicks. And if any of them fell to the Knicks and I think the Knicks would take him. And I almost want to throw Johnny Davis in there too. Because it feels like Johnny Davis is like, as a, again, you start to nitpick and like questions get raised about these guys. He's a dude who could, he could score, you know, he's going to be able to score and you know, he defends and he's, he's a nice size. He rebounds his position. Like he could do some different stuff. Like there's a safety there with just enough upside. I think that he could probably go into this group as well. So then what's left. And then you could tell you could give me another dozen names if not more of guys who it's like, Hey, you know, I could see that being the pick. I could see this being the pick. I don't know that I love any of them enough to feel great about taking them at 11. Um, I hear your Eason argument. I, I, I respect it. He's tall, he's long and he's strong and he is really smart out there on the court. And that's it in one sentence. That's it. I tell you, I'd be scared about taking Griffin. The medical, the medical thing. And I don't know, maybe it's all bullshit. That's my number one target over on draft class that I keep pushing is AJ Griffin. It's because we're in a spot where we can bet on that. Uh, but if I were in New Orleans, man, I have I've had New Orleans in my draft class mock drafts pass on AJ Griffin because they already have a dookie with injury concerns and they certainly do not need another. I just he's missed time literally every year he's played basketball since he was 13. I had someone uh, reach out to me who told me a story about someone who was involved with uh, uh, un, like high school hoops in the, you know, worst up in, up in that step, step in, step in, right? Step in, step in, neck they're of the woods. In, they're in the circuits. They're in the circuits is the, the yeah. term for that. Tell me about a story about his, his kid was there in a gym, in the gym on like a snowy night, uh, getting shots up and AJ Griffin was there and he was in a walking boot. And this is when he was 13 years old and he missed time uh, as a sophomore. He missed time as a junior. He missed time as he missed his entire senior season in high school. And then he suffered an injury at the beginning of the, in the pre or yeah, in a practice before Duke season. And that's why he, he, his first, like uh, I think it was his first eight games. he like really didn't play much. Like at some point it's not a coincidence. Um, all that being said, is there enough there that if he's there, is he the pick? Probably. Can I give you the name that I really like? I'll give you the no. name that I really like. Yeah, of course. Go ahead. I like Blake Wesley from Notre Dame. Oh, welcome. That I'm a big is fan of Bl- someone on draft class who I've been saying is absolutely not going to go in the lottery and is my closest thing outside of the lottery to returning lottery value. I'm, I'm a big fan. I think he is currently not a good shooter, nor does he have good touch. <laughs> What and gave he, that away? The the 30% for three the, the or the 40% histo- overall? The historically bad percentages. But you want to talk yeah. about people overhyping people because of playoff runs. You know, people say I overhyped EJ Liddell because I like Grant Williams when I actually fucking hate Grant Williams. So suck it. Uh, the thing with Blake Wesley, who, um, who he reminds me of is Jordan Poole. Jordan Poole came in as a prospect, was not a fantastic shooter. He did not have amazing touch around the rim. And, and those are two things. One, the shooting pretty easy to improve if you have the second, which he did not. Mm-hmm. And lo and behold, 
with a lot of reps in the G League, which is again evil to some people for some reason. You know, like Deuce going down there, I didn't hate. Um, he got good. And yeah. then the signs of, oh, when this kid puts it all together, he's going to be terrifying. Well, now he's contributing in the NBA finals. And even if he's now getting a little overrated because the pool party act, you know, that's a little too fun for people. And I think, you know, the, the he's better than RJ and this and this went a little too far, um, but he's really good. And he was not a good shooter or and he just, he reminds me a lot of Wesley, but Wesley actually has a longer wingspan and probably has shown less propensity to want to defend the point of attack. But I think if you play him off ball at the two, he could like, kill it on, he could kill it on defense. So. That's all. That's all develop. It's all stuff you develop as an organization. And it's like Johnny Bryant. Hopefully. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if the Knicks are really going to make a bet on their development staff continuing to be good. And I think it has been good. Then I think that's a kid you draft because again, like just you watch what he's able to do in terms of getting downhill and attacking the rim. And like, you know, he has the handle, he has the burst, he has all of the stuff that you want. Um, everything else is a mess, but the stuff that you can't teach, uh, he, he has it. So I like him as a trade down guy. And then the, the last thing I'll say is so, so Chan is the, the one guy I have not really done my deep dive homework on. And I have a feeling I'm going to like him. So I'll say that. Um, because I know you're like me and fall in love with players who can't really shoot, but make up for it by trying their ass off. Yeah. I think you're going to really like him too. So had 36% catch and shoot from three, not terrible. And then you realize he shot like 50 something percent at the free throw line. And you're like, Holy moly. Yeah. Um, but listen, this kid uh, has lived all around the world. You know, he, in, in, in his short life thus far, he has lived in like four different countries. He knows what it's like to have to get accustomed to a new crazy space. I think New York is something that he could handle. That box is checked. Um, he says he looks up to Draymond Green and he wants to be the player that players win or lose, go back to the locker room and are like, God, I do not want to be matched up against you, him ever again. Like, you know, the, I love like him. I love him. The, the thing like, I feel like after every draft, there's a guy or two where you watch him on the NBA on an NBA court and you hear people that are like who do this for a living and they and they will say about a guy like, man, if if this whatever this is, if this part of his game ever comes around, oh my God, watch out. And I have a feeling so so is gonna be a guy within the first month of his NBA career, if he gets time, is gonna be someone you look at and it's like, wow. If the shot ever comes around, holy shit, did whatever team drafted him get a get a guy? Is he going to be your primary playmaker? No. If he's on the court with one guy who can tilt the floor and he's able to draw closeouts on threes, he is going to pump fake, get the defense to bite, get into the paint and make a gorgeous dish to an open shooter. Yeah, I think the stuff that we love OB for. This kid is going to kick your ass on defense like he's like the anti OB and Putting them together would be really fascinating to me. Coming next up from Thorsten, he wants to know your prediction for the starting five next year. It's a five-word answer. It's a very hard one. <laughs> okay. Uh, RJ. Uh, Fournier. Randall. The easy ones out of the way. <laughs> to some people off. Uh, Miles Turner. You have pissed me off. Thank you. I've, I've pissed myself off. This is no, this is this is what he, he this can't is my shoot. Can't this, shoot. This He's is my prediction, shooter. right? Right? Isn't this my prediction? This I'm is gonna, not my I'm gonna put you through a wall. Yes, yes, it is. Okay, so this is not what I want. I okay. Just for being very clear. Um and so if I have if I have Turner, I can't have Brogdon too. I think I think I, I think there's a good chance one of them ends up on the Knicks. Um, and I think of the two, I think I know the smokes around Brad. Then I think I think it's Turner. Um, man, how crazy do we want to get here? That's the thing is I don't even have like a real. I don't have a good. Ah, fuck it. Let's go, uh, Brunson. I was gonna say, Tom Thibodeau, coach, front office member. Player, the point guard, you know, <laughs> he does a little bit of everything. Suit him up. 
All right. I have a final question for you um, that I don't know how these next few years as a, as a Nick fan are going to go, but I know that I'll never forget last, not this season, but last season ever uh-huh. in my life. And that's why I picked this question because it's, it's really interesting. And I know how you feel about Sir Julius of Randall, but I, 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 I got to know. I got to know. So I, I, I saved this for last. No funny chicken cutlet question. No, you know, who would you, what former Nick would you call a game with? But Jonas Plout wants to know, knowing what we know now, if you could go back to 2019 oh, well. and sign or not sign Julius Randall, what would you do? Does his one incredibly memorable season still carry enough weight to outweigh the two bad seasons, the hoopla, Andrew Q, the SpongeBob clip, and to a larger extent, the contract extension? So the so, difficult part with this question is like the knowing what we know now. We didn't know that when we when the Knicks signed him. Right, John? Like that's that what? That, that's the entire equation. Knowing what we know now, of course that does that would change things but well no i think it's an interesting i think it's an interesting question knowing what we know now would you still sign him knowing what we know now would you hop in the time machine and cut his pen in half while he's signing the contract and make it never happen like i I think is how it's the like number one objective across the board to get him off the team this year and it's harder because he's guaranteed another four years isn't it obvious no I don't think I think it's a no. So my my set my answer is no. I don't think they I would not sign him. I don't think it's obvious because for as much as I loathe is probably not a strong enough word. Um having watched him play last year there is a world where he turns it around. You know, I don't I know some of us are our mileages may vary on on how the likelihood we think of that it's this world it's this world because chris believes in julius <laughs> randall and and santa claus yeah. um there is a world where he t- <laughs> why would you say that he's not real <laughs> for all the kids watching santa spoiler, claus is real Don't spoiler worry. Spoiler. what do you mean <laughs> so um yes there is a i think there's a world where he turns around and even if he doesn't like i don't know maybe i I put too much into I think the, I think he was an important component to like RJ's development like that that was a thing I, I don't know about right now um and last year was a reminder like man when when they're winning and they're good in New York like things are different all that being said if they do, if they don't sign him um I think Steve Mills and Oh wait, that's right. Scott Perry didn't lose his job. Still, Scott Perry still works for the Knicks. I think Steve Mills still gets still gets fired, um, and they probably still hire Tibbs. And then you're starting last season with a roster. You're do you still dra- that's the see, but that's the that's the tricky part, the domino effect. You still draft Obi. They probably would have traded up for Obi if Randall was not on the team. Because well, so no, hold, but hold on, I, because I, I have Andrew a clarification. Go. Is this not signing extension or are we going back to 20? No, this is not no, signing back, him in 2019. Back to that act, okay. Now it's a difficult question. Back I misunderstood in the 2019. Question. Okay. Are because here, you giving up last year the we here run no. to have thank you. Now, oh, now so I'm on board with you. Now thank you. See, here's the thing. And I don't mean to hijack the question, John. No, go ahead. Oh, no, hijack. Like, Do it, please. I, I've talked about this before. What happened in 2019? were two dudes that, for whatever we think of them now, in the moment, two of the elite names in the NBA chose a team that I've never met a fan of in real life and I've lived in this city most of my life. Okay? They chose to go there because it was such a mess here. And in one season, we were like Julius Randle was a bigger name than both of them. That's what that we here was. I'm going to add in the fact we were stuck inside for a year with gloom and doom and how good it was for all of our mental health that we got to watch a team. Granted, because we got to watch him and not be in the building, that probably was responsible for Julius Randle being as good as he was. <laughs> but having said that, you don't cha- you don't trade seasons like that. Chris, the season you got into the Knicks, 2013, 
You wouldn't trade that year for anything. It got you into the Knicks, right? It's it was why a you bunch care of about the geezers it. hooping. We knew they weren't going to replicate it. We knew it wasn't going to happen again. And it's and, a special I, season, I, I right? I wouldn't trade it for the world. That that I still see the really poorly photoshopped Carmelo Anthony scoring title edit that I had as my wallpaper I, on, on my PC on. back then. Can I give you a hot take? All the respect, yeah. Andrew. I don't disagree with anything you're saying, mm-hmm. Chris. I get it. The the hundred percent. What's to say they couldn't have had a seat? Not that good because Julius Randle was an MVP candidate and no one like, I don't care how much time Obi Toppin or Manu quickly or RJ Barrett got like that was not in the cards last year. But what's to say that they could have had a similar surprising season in their first year under Tibbs? Who's the guy that he rides with that type of usage rate and that type of heavy lifting on the offense? Okay. I'm not saying a four seed. But that's what's my this, point what, is that what, happened. What, we know that happened. So they already started that season with the lowest over under in Vegas in the league. So what, however, like they, you can't get worse than that. Mm-hmm. Assuming they started with that terrible projection. And if they got into like the play in or something or like just missed the play in and it was all on the backs of like, Dra- players that were drafted and like young rookie contract players. And then we got a draft pick out of it in addition to, and like, you know, and um, not as special. They host I'm not a saying it's a special, but you know what? I'm, I mean, I'm 30, I'm going to be 40 fucking years old next year. I'm tired of, of grabbing at these little bits of, of glory to 2012, 13, 2020, 21. Give me a franchise that has a chance to be a, a power player in the league for a long time. The odds of that happening are better if they never sign Randall, I think. Because I think the, the problem, problem is that we know what we know now, though, is like that happened. Like, like I don't care. I don't care. I'll give it. A, I'm happy to give it back. You're willing to give, to give it back. It, to who, take a chance. Who says, it. though, that they they end up getting Rose? Remember, Rose met with Randall about the next Knicks coach before he was even hired. Right. Like mm. who, who says that Kenny Atkinson isn't just letting quickly chuck threes and contributing to the Lou Will uh, you know, archetype? Like who's to say no, they what, get quickly if we are if uh, Wes it, is the one listen, campaigning for him in the war room, you know, exactly. You know, so I many other dominoes get, are different. I think they still get Leon Rose. And if, by the way, if they didn't get Leon Rose, they, um, they, no, I mean, do they hire Masai? They might give Masai. That's just, it's How, a different world. I yeah. will trade every good Knicks memory I have in my life for Masai Ujiri to run my you, basketball. You team. really love that guy. Oh my God. What I wouldn't give. You want to, you want to do what Masai would do? Trade down and take Jalen Williams. And then you don't need to hire him. Just, <laughs> just do I, that. I think I that am, might be a little bit of an oversimplification. I respect John's wear and tear of being a Knicks fan for as long as you have. I'm not that far behind you. I'm someone who does I know. remember portions of the 90s and remembers what? when this team, I know, before you were born, when this team was a perennial playoff team and a contender. Um, I'm saying that 2021 season, it was the most fun I've ever had rooting for this team. I'm including all the expectations years like 2013, like 99, like 2000, like like those late 90s teams because it came out of nowhere. They were playing with, with house money once they exceeded 22 wins and they won 41 and hosted a playoff series. Did it you know, crash and burn in the playoffs when we found out this team might have not been as good as we thought they were? Yeah, but... It's part of the journey. And look, this season was probably as equally as frustrating. And it's because of the guy that's the topic of this question. But yeah, I that 2021 season was personally bigger for other reasons than just what does it matter to the Knicks? That was the no, first, I, first time I experienced anything happy in the world in the last two years. And it was like, oh, wow, the Knicks actually re- made me forget that we're in a pandemic. For the, for the last 19 months, you know, Listen, that was magical. The nine game winning streak was like, oh, my God, that was that was that that felt like that's like what it felt like. Or is what I always imagined it felt like to be a fan of like a functional mm-hmm. team. Um, and I trade it. <laughs> All right. I give it away. Wow. You're a sicko. But with that, that was our final question. So 
Thank you. For you realize it. there are Chris Percy Einans out there, young Chris Percy Einans, who's like 2013 was his year to get into the Knicks. There are young I, Knicks fans that got into the Knicks and chose the Knicks over Brooklyn because of last season. And he would go up to the cliff and throw him off it like Simba. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> like Mike Rafiki throwing Simba off the cliff. Chris, that's one of the funniest things you've ever said. <laughs> Listen, man, I'm just trying to win a championship before uh, I die. John, John looked at the, the camp and said, fuck them kids. Yep. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what I did. Oh, uh, man. All right. This was well, good. Good, good questions you, as thank always. Thank you for, for standing at the podium and, uh, and you know, being a, a, what is it, a testimony? Do, do your testimony at the, you're the lawyer. I don't know. Last question comes from me. What do you guys think they do on draft night? I was about to ask the same thing. Uh, Chris, you go first. I think Bradley Beal wants Johnny Davis on his basketball team because of what that means he won't have to do defensively. Uh, um, and so despite Dyson Daniels being a big thing there, I think Davis goes at 10. And with that being said, I think that is the last one of the Knicks guys who would have been on the board there. I think they get totally screwed in their, in their eyes and, and none of their guys are there at 11, but they do the signature, the, the Brock Aller, and they trade down. Now I don't know with who, I don't know for what, but they end up grabbing someone, not Ty Ty, you know, maybe Branham, maybe Jalen Williams. They grab one of those guys and an extra asset with which they can trade for a star or include in a package. And, you know, then they sit at 42 and maybe they try to trade up. I don't know if anyone wants a second rounder in this class. Um, and then my prediction for undrafted free agency is that Michael Foster Jr. will be a Nick. Cause yes, I have undrafted free agency predictions now. I was about to say, if Michael Foster Jr. could walk into my living room right now and I wouldn't know who he is. Michael um, Foster Jr. is uh, basically 22 year old Taj. He's if old man Taj Gibson okay. was 22. Got and it. I think Tibbs, Darren Urban coached him. He, he, Jalen Williams and, and Foster were both on Urban's team at the combine. Okay. We know that they take that stuff seriously. Yeah, they do. Foster just straight up outplayed a lot of those guys. He was from G League Ignite. He was not someone who got a lot of attention. He was just flat out better than a lot of people. I think they see that. I think they see that Todd is aging and they, they, they seize the opportunity. But I don't know if he gets drafted at all. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so just to be just to clarify, you think the first nine and or first ten in some order will be Jabari, Chet, Paolo, Ivy, um, Murray, Sharp, Daniels, Matherin, and Davis, right? Yes. Okay. So and oh, so wait, how many players did I just name? Six, seven, eight, nine. I named not and Griffin. Yeah, AJ Griffin and, gone and Griffin too, would, and that that's why they don't. Okay, you know, none of their guys are on the are on the clock at eleven. Sohan, I can't see them taking Berman. He said he can't see them taking Eason, uh, and I trust him on that. They can't so, take Sohan unless they have a trade lined up. For, if if they take Sohan, then then one of the two, one of Julius or or Obi is is gone. Like within the week. Uh, I I I I, I have to be boring. I I agree completely with Chris. I think that's exactly what they're going to do. Yay. <laughs> but man, I, oh man, I, I buy the, I buy everything about that. They are trying hard for Ivy. I don't think it's just smoke. I think they're trying hard. I just, I agree. I don't know what they're going to give up. If Berman calls a prospect the apple of their eye, like that's not a thing he says. That's very uncharacteristic. And that sounds like whenever, whenever someone who is a reporter I trust says something and I read them a lot and I know what they sound like and they say something that doesn't sound like them, I just assume they're just you know, not, not to use this detrimentally, but like they're just parroting their source. And yeah. But just to be very very clear and i i think this newsletter is now when was the lamello draft two years ago yeah this newsletter is now two years old and i still refer to it um because i don't want to do this homework again uh i went through 30 years of trades to get up into the top five like yeah there's like some strange old shit like uh here, here's a question chris do you know who antonio mcdice is Yes. <laughs> okay. So once Come upon on. a time, Antonio McDyess was the second pick of the draft and uh, Denver traded up to get him by packaging 15 and Rodney Rogers, 
Rodney Rogers is not a particularly special basketball player, as Andrew probably remembers. Um, but like there's anomalies. There's like weird shit that happened, like the Steve Francis trade. You want to go to that as being just kind of like a strange one. But again, that was weird because he he was forcing his way out of Vancouver. So let's just even if we just limit it to like the last 20 years, there is not really an analogous trade to a team moving up from where the Knicks are in this draft 11th to up to four when four is this much of a premium pick in, in this draft um, or in, 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 in the draft. Um, So it would be virtually unprecedented. Maybe they do it. I really hope they do. I hope they figure out a way to make it, a way to make it happen, but it would be, it, it would just be unprecedented. That's all. That's why I asked Mark. I was like, this front office is obsessed with winning deals. Would they lose one if it meant them getting Jaden Ivy? Like, would they overpay? But like it, so, but this this front office also employs Walt Perrin. And I understand the deal was different. Six and the future first for three. I'm talking about the Deron Williams deal. Um, you know, in that future first, they knew it was not going to be a great first. But like, if they believe Ivy is the guy. It, I'm not going to say it doesn't matter what they give up to get him. I think they will believe that they are winning the deal because they are getting the special guy, you know? Um, and like, I, I ju- but I just don't know because they're not going to trade RJ. Like that's not going to, they're, they're not going to trade RJ Barrett, but like, and I think they will trade on, I think they'll trade anything else, including quickly to, to move up to four. I just yeah. don't know if that's going to be, enough like i don't know do the kings uh, here's a crazy question we'll, we'll end it after this do the kings want new york of course they want new york's unprotected 2023 pick but like given their current organizational priorities where they are ostensibly selling out to make the playoffs this year like that's a, a beautiful asset to have right it's an amazing asset to have do they feel like all right we're going to get that asset and we feel good about how we're going to parlay that into x y or z whether it's in a week or three months that it makes enough of a difference for us to pass on, you know, Ivy today. Like, I don't know the answer to that question. That might be a little too much nuance for Sacramento, but uh... <laughs> give them some credit. I mean, listen, they, they did just trade away the first important player in the, since I, I don't know when that actually wanted to be there in uh, how many years, two decades. And I said, I thought that deal was fine for both sides, but the, the media wouldn't have you know that the nah, media I mean, said it, Sacramento made the worst trade in NBA history. It's not, it's not the worst trade in NBA history, but like the value is, I, the value is like, again, it's like quote unquote fair value, but let's, like I don't know. I didn't, I didn't love, I didn't love the deal anyway. All right. Uh, good question, Andrew. What do you think they'll do? Um, so I'm not a draft expert, nor do I pretend to be. So I'll just go for the sound bite. You know what I think will happen on draft night, John? What? Jaden Ivey will be a New York Knicks. There you go. I'm calling it here now. You heard it here first on Knicks Film School Podcast. Your lips to God's ears. Yep. And then if it's right, I'm going to clip this and just let this be what was said on the Knicks Film School Podcast. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Andrew, phenomenal job as always. Chris Percy Einan, masterclass. All right. Bye, everybody. <laughs>